Good morning aspirants, welcome to daily newspaper analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 31st May 2025. So these are the 5 important topics we are going to discuss in this video. The first topic about increase in Indian coastline. So the Indian coastline length was increased recently and what is the reason? So this is what we are going to discuss in this news. The second article is about the oil spill, the recent oil spill in the Kerala coast. The third article is about the TN space industrial policy. Tamil Nadu government has announced its own space industrial policy. The fourth article is about the danger in the sea. So this is also about the India's maritime disaster preparedness. So this is in the light of recent uh, shipwreck in Kerala coast. And we are going to discuss about the maritime preparedness of India. What are the challenges in it and what will be the way forward. The fifth article is about the Manipur violence. Why there is a, a recent tensions and still not the peace has achieved in Manipur. So these are the five important topics we are going to discuss in this video. Now let us get into the discussion. Before getting into the discussion, this is an important announcement. Shankar IAS Academy's regular batch is starting on 6th June and a new CSAT batch is starting on 23rd June. So look at the details here, interested aspirants can use it. Now let us get into the discussion. Now look at this article. In 2024, Union Ministry of Home Affairs has announced that India's coastline has increased. So, our coastline was previously measured as 7516 km and now it was determined as 11098 km. So, there is a drastic increase in the length of coastline but this does not mean that India got more land or new islands. This is just a, a change in measurement of coastline, how we measure the coastline has been changed. So, there were no political or uh, natural events which caused this increase in coastline, just uh, how we measure the coastline has been changed. If you take Goa, the last coastal state to join India, it became part of our country in 1961. And Sikkim, uh, which joined in 1975, is also a landlocked state. And even India-Bangladesh land swap happened in 2015, which also involved only inland territories. So, there is no way that India got new land or a new island. But this increase in coastline is about how the coastline is measured and not due to actual changes on the ground. In 1970s, our coastline was measured to be a length of 7516 km. In 2024, it was measured to be 11098.8 km. Previously, we used paper maps to determine the length of coastline. Now, we are using digital tools like electronic navigation charts. Previously, we used the manual drawing methods. Now, we are using the GIS satellite tools and drones. So, the techniques we are using and the tools we used have also changed which uh, created a new length of Indian coastline. Many islands were also not included in past calculation. Now, we are including every island and the coastlines are measured in detail. So, now the coastline is measured with more accuracy and greater detail by using advanced technology and better maps. Now look at this prelims practice question. The apparent increase in India's coastline length is due to inclusion of new offshore islands and sediment deposition from river deltas. So this statement is incorrect because it is not due to uh, the inclusion of offshore islands or sediment deposition. Look at the second statement. The coastline paradox demonstrates that coastline length is not a fixed value and varies depending on the scale or resolution of measurement. This statement is correct. So, the correct answer is option B, 2 only. With this, let us move to the next news article. Now, look at this article. A cargo ship named MSC Elsa 3 fall off the coast of Kerala. As a result, several containers have been washed ashore in Kollam and Alapura. Some of these containers even had calcium carbide, which is a dangerous chemical. So, this has raised concerns about chemical leak, fire and serious environmental damage. An oil spill was also reported near the area. So, this led authorities to ban the fishing and issue high alert along the coastline. The exact reason for the fall of the ship is not yet confirmed. It could be due to the rough sea conditions due to onset of monsoon or due to poor handling or securing the dangerous cargo or due to the improper monitoring and early warning systems. But the exact reason for this ship's fall is not yet confirmed. This situation poses several risks. Firstly, the calcium carbide can react with the water and can re release the acetylene gas. This gas is highly flammable and even cause explosions. 
it may also cause chemical burns and breathing problems and it also contaminate the water the oil spills also add damage to the environment by threatening the marine life so this affects the food chain and income of the coastal fishing communities people living along the coast will have serious health problems due to their toxic gas exposure their livelihoods are also impacted because of fishing and beach tourism are now restricted in these areas with reference to chemical calcium carbide consider the following statements it reacts with the water to produce acetylene gas which is flammable it is used in artificial ripening of fruits it is non toxic and safe to handle with bare hands which of the statements given above are correct the correct answer is option a first and second statements are correct the third statement is incorrect because it is a toxic gas and not safe to handle with bare hands so with this let us move on to the next news article now look at this article tamil nadu became the third indian state after karnataka and gujarat to launch its own space industrial policy the main aim of this policy is to attract investment worth of more than 10000 crore and also to create jobs more than 10000 both indirectly and directly for the next 5 years so this is the aim of the tamil nadu space industrial policy and the policy focuses on building important parts of space sector such as satellite manufacturing launch services and other space related technologies the government also wants to use this space technology to improve the public services like disaster management agriculture health care and urban planning so to support this tamil nadu is offering several incentives for the space industries firstly they are providing the payroll subsidy so this will help the companies which have r&d units or global capacity centers in the space sector so this will reduce their employee cost this will also encourage the innovation and high skilled jobs tamil nadu government is also providing industrial housing incentive which gives developers a 10% subsidy to build houses for workers in order to promote the green and sustainable development the policy also offers 25% capital subsidy this is for setting up eco friendly infrastructure additionally certain areas in the state will be marked as space base this means these are special areas where they have incentives for smaller investments in space sector so this is like a special economic zones for uh, industries and exports so they will have space base which are a special areas in tamil nadu which will have incentives for space industries so this will help spread the development of space sector instead of focusing it only in big cities so these are some of the focus areas of space development in tamil nadu building satellites launch and reusable launch vehicles creating uh, strategic electronics and space grade components in space manufacturing and refueling so these focus areas include both upstream activities like manufacturing and launching and also the downstream activities like using the satellite data for real world application tamil nadu already has several strategic advantages in space sector for example the isro propulsion complex is situated in mahendragiri in tirunelveli so this complex works on engine testing and technology development for space mission also the isro is setting up a new space fort in kulasekarapattinam which is in thoothukudi so this will be india's second launch site and this will also be perfect for launching satellites into polar orbits so these are some of the advantages for tamil nadu already in space sector now look at this prelims practice question what is the primary role of isro propulsion complex in tamil nadu the correct answer is option c testing cryogenic and earth storable propellant engines so with this let us move on to the next news article now look at this editorial page article we are going to discuss about the same elsa 3 incident of the coast of kerala but here we are going to discuss about india's maritime disaster preparedness what are the challenges in india's maritime disaster preparedness and what should be the way forward so we are going to discuss this topic in the mains exam perspective this cargo ship which carried the hazardous materials caused severe safety concerns and environmental concerns it had 13 containers of dangerous cargo which includes a calcium carbide and rubber solution this fall of ship has already caused the plastic pellets to wash off the coast 
So, this incident shows that India should have adequate system for maritime disaster. Past incidents like 2017 Chennai oil spill shows that the extent of ecological damage caused by the oil spill. The leakage of plastic pellets into the sea creates a long time harm to the marine life because cleaning of this plastic pellets from the ocean is very difficult and it is also very difficult to trace these uh, pellets and cleaning them up. So, this might lead to long term damages to the marine life. Let us see the institutional and policy framework regarding the maritime disaster preparedness. India relies on the National Oil Spill Disaster Contingency Plan and this plan is operated by the Coast Guard and it serves as the primary oil spill response mechanism. However, this framework lacks the real time coordination with the state agencies. They also lack the real time coordination with the private ports. The Director General of Shipping who is responsible for the safety of shipping is also weak in enforcing the container inspection and monitoring the aging vehicles. Also, India's ability to respond to this maritime disasters is limited by the fragmented authority. Another important challenge is poor interagency communication and outdated infrastructure. Enforcement of international regulation like maritime, international maritime dangerous goods code is also weak in our country and the tracking of dangerous cargo is inadequate. Moreover, the coastal communities who are affected first due to this maritime disasters are not involved in planning and training to reduce these impacts. In order to address these issues, India must strengthen the institutional mechanism first. The Coast Guard and the National Action Plan regarding this maritime disaster should be empowered with the real-time tracking system and a joint coordination platform. Major ports must be set up with a nodal disaster cells, so they can conduct their regular emergency drills and can act upon the maritime disaster in a real time manner. The hazardous cargo in ships should be digitally tracked through the blockchain based systems. Additionally, training the coastal communities and using modern technology like drones, satellite imaging and marine surveillance will improve early response and monitoring. So, in conclusion, this ELSA 3 incident is a warning for India. The country aims to become a global maritime power, but its disaster preparedness must be improved a lot. A decentralized and a technology driven approach is necessary for handling these maritime disasters. So, with this, let us wind up the discussion. And this is a main practice question regarding this topic. Examine the challenges in India's response mechanism to maritime disasters in the light of recent MSC Elsa 3 incident of the Kochi coast. Suggest measures to strengthen India's maritime disaster preparedness. So, we have to address what are the challenges in India's response mechanism and what should be the measures to be taken to strengthen this disaster preparedness. So, with this let us move on to the next topic. After intense ethnic violence which broke out in May 2023 in Manipur, President rule was imposed. Even after the President rule, uh, there is a, even though there is significant reduction in the violence, the peace and normalcy is still a dream in Manipur. There was ongoing distress, displacement and lack of reconciliation between the two important tribes, the Meiti tribe and Kukiso community. So, this uh, distrust and displacement have destabilized the region. Also, the recent incidents like protest during the Juri Lili festival have also reignited the tensions. So, this reflects the fragility of the situation. So, this is what discussed in this editorial page article. Now, let us discuss the key challenges which still persist in Manipur. One is ethnic polarization and displacement. There was deep rooted communal divide between the Meiti tribe and Kukiso tribe. The Meitis live mostly in the valley of Manipur and the Kukiso communities live in the hills. So, the deep rooted communal divide between the two tribes have led to ethnic polarization and this is one of the major challenge for the recent tensions. The thousands of these tribal people are displaced and they are unable to return to their home due to lack of safety and property loss. There was also no signs of reconciliation in Manipur. Reconciliation is very critical for long term peace and there is no sign of reconciliation. 
The next one is breakdown of trust in state institution. The civil society groups have replaced the formal institutions and they act as the mediators of peace. The symbolic actions of the state government also which is perceived as the appeasement process or bias against certain communities have increased the tensions. So there is a trust deficit in the state government institutions. The next important challenge is militancy and armed groups. Even though there is partial recovery of looted arms from the militants, they still exert their influence in the region. So the presence of these armed ethnic groups threatens the peace forever. They also discourage the return of displaced families to their original land. The next one is the vacancy in governance. With the impact of the president rule in the place, there is no democratically elected assembly. Some MLAs claim to have majority demanding the restoration of assembly in Manipur. But restoring the assembly will prematurely exaggerate the situation. The next one is demand for separate administration. The Kukiso communities demand for separate administration and this has also sharpened the ethnic tensions. The Métis group sees them as a threat to Manipur's territorial integrity. So this demand for separate administration from Kukiso groups have intensified this situation. Now what can be the way forward? One is re-establishing the law and order. There should be complete disarmament of all insurgent and militant groups both in the valleys and the hills. We should strengthen the neutral security forces, make them more present in the valley and hills and prevent any community dominated paramilitary setup. So there should be presence of neutral security forces without the community dominated ones. Next one is inclusive peace process. We should initiate a broad based dialogue involving all the communities, civil society and neutral facilitators. Next one is building confidence building mechanism. So the safe return of the displaced communities, the common cultural events and the neutral uh, distribution of aids and help should be uh, carried on. So this will encourage the confidence building between the communities. And this is a main practice question regarding this topic. With this, let us conclude the discussion. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankaraya's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.